Another day, another rare world test. Today, we're doing it on the OnePlus Open, the first foldable from OnePlus. And as per the usual, we will explore all while we test out this phone. But first things first. Coffee. Check. And we're at Blackstone Coffee Roasters, a local neighborhood deli in the West Village and a spiritual successor to Jesse's, which was a deli here in the 1980s. Originally owned by Jesse and run by his three sons, Jesse's Deli was a staple in the West Village that was doing well from all the business that came in from St. Vincent's Hospital nearby. Jesse had decided to actually expand at one point into the space next door and almost immediately after, St. Vincent's Hospital closed and the decrease in business was just too much for the new rent. And in 2011, it closed down. There's now a Dwayne Reed in its place. But in 2017, one of Jesse's sons, Sammy, opened a deli-like spot just like his father's down the street here and now carries on the family legacy with Blackstone Coffee Roasters. With, of course, a bigger emphasis on coffee, but plenty of deli sandwiches you'd expect. While we're here though, let's talk about the design of the new OnePlus Open. And size and shape-wise, it fits somewhere between the Google Pixel Fold's more squat look and the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 5's TV remote control skinnier look. Now to me, the Z Fold 5 has always felt a bit too skinny as the width makes it hard to type on, among other things. And because of that fact, I found myself opening it a lot more. But the Pixel Fold's width and size made it a lot more usable while closed. And the OnePlus Open is definitely closer to that, but less wide, which makes it actually feel a bit more like a normal phone when it's closed. It's also a bit lighter than the other two foldables at 245 grams, at least for the green one that I have. The black one is actually a tad lighter. And that's versus the 253 grams of the Z Fold 5 and 283 grams of the Pixel Fold. So it's at least closer to the weight of a normal phone. 10 grams or so more than the S23 Ultra, for example. I will say that using it, the hinge feels solid and the device closes without any gap, which is nice, but the hinge isn't quite as stiff, so opening it is easier, which you might prefer, but opening it too far out when on a table, for example, it'll snap all the way open compared to the Z Fold 5 and the Pixel Fold. Now, when it is open, it's 5.8 millimeters thin, which matches the Pixel Fold, and it's 0.3 millimeters thinner than the Z Fold 5. And when closed, it's 11.7 millimeters compared to the 12.1 of the Pixel Fold and 13.4 of the Z Fold 5. Something where it lags behind the other two in terms of design is the fact that both the Pixel Fold and the Z Fold 5 have an IPX8 rating, aka full immersion in water for up to 30 minutes, versus the IPX4 splash resistance for the OnePlus Open. So, a little rain is fine, but it's at least not rated for a puddle. And moving around to the back, we have a huge camera circle, which I actually kind of like, and it gives it its own unique look compared to the Pixel Fold and the Z Fold 5's own looks that they sort of own now as well. It actually reminds me of a point and shoot camera. Rip point and shoot cameras. Video on that below though, if you're curious. The color I have is a green matte color, which I also really like, but they also have a black vegan leather, which is someone who likes a bit of color in their tech, wouldn't be my first choice, but the texture look is nicer than a glass back and it feels really good to hold. Something carried over from OnePlus's other phones, there's an alert slider to quickly switch from silent to vibrate to ring. But I personally, like I do on every device that has an alert slider of some sort, will just set it to vibrate and never touch it again. For the displays, we have a 6.3 inch 20 by nine aspect LTPO display on the outside that can go from 120 Hertz or 120 frames a second to make animations and scrolling look smoother down to 10 Hertz or 10 frames a second to save power when there's something static on the screen, like an image, for example. Now that is paired with a 7.8 two inch LTPO inner display when unfolded, which similarly can hit 120 Hertz, but can also go down further to one Hertz for static images to save even more power theoretically. Both displays also have a crazy high claimed brightness of 2800 nits. I'm not sure if it can hit that exact number, but regardless, they're definitely bright enough to see in direct sunlight and that's all that really matters to me. Also, I don't really care that much, but people that do care will be pleased to know that the crease is pretty well hidden. You actually have to tilt the device against a reflection to try to find it. Also, we have a much smaller bezels than the Pixel Fold, maybe unsurprisingly. All in all, it looks and feels good and it's pretty satisfying to open and close too. We are that far along in fall.
Welcome to the Gansevoort Peninsula Sand Bluff. Which, funny enough, is Manhattan's first ever beach. It opened in early October after 25 years in the making. Located within the Hudson River Park along the Hudson River, the 5.5 acre space features 1,200 tons of sand, Adirondack chairs, and a misting feature for cooling down or rinsing off sand. Which is not on now because it's actually cold out. I would come to a beach in autumn. Despite the substantial improvement in water quality in the Hudson River since the enactment of the Clean Water Act in the 1970s, it's important to note that Gansevoort Peninsula has been specifically designed as a sunbathing beach only, according to the park. No swimming allowed. Honestly, probably a good call. To the north of Gansevoort Peninsula, a unique salt marsh has been created, marking the first of its kind on the Manhattan side of the Hudson River. The salt marsh consists of native grasses and plantings and incorporates submerged reef balls and oyster gabions, which are essentially cages that oysters can live in that allows for better exposure to oxygen and plankton. And they've been stocked with over 20 million juvenile oysters. Now these elements all serve multiple purposes, including providing valuable habitat, enhancing resilience, and acting as an educational resource for the public to understand the ecological advantage of intertidal ecosystems, even ones that are, you know, in the Hudson River. Okay, for the OnePlus Opens software, that's worth mentioning when it comes to it being a foldable. We have the same multitasking built into Android now, which is very useful with things like a taskbar that you can drag things up to open them as a split screen window. OnePlus though at least adds their own extra window over the standard two with their own software on top of that to get to three. Samsung actually adds two extras for four total using their own software. Now personally though, two is enough for me on such large screens like these. So I'm happy with all three of these foldables when it comes to this multitasking stuff. Now besides that, OnePlus hasn't added as much of their own software to the open to help with foldable things like Samsung has. Samsung being on their fifth foldable generation has already done a great job of adding in features to fix pain points and Android itself can't cover for foldables just yet. OnePlus simply hasn't had the time. Regardless, you do get all the same benefits that all folding phones get, including the ability to use them as their own built-in stand for maybe watching content or doing a video call, or even for using them as a tripod for the camera when you don't have someone to hold the phone for you. We also have the ability to use the much better rear cameras for selfies by tapping this button to get a preview of the cameras on the front display. Now, speaking of those better cameras on the back, the OnePlus Open has an ultra-wide 48 megapixel half-inch sensor with an f2.2 aperture and 0.8 micron size pixels that get binned by default in sets of four to get a 12 megapixel image with 1.6 micron size pixels to gather more light per pixel to get better low light shots. We also have a three times telephoto 60 4 megapixel half inch sensor that is an f 2.6 aperture with 0.7 micron size pixels that also get binned by default in sets of 4 to get a 16 megapixel image with 1.4 micron sized pixels. And we also get a 6x option in the camera as a sensor crop of the 3x thanks to those higher megapixels. Basically, it cuts out the middle 16 megapixels to get a further focal range. Similar to putting an APS-C lens on a full frame sensor, how that moves the focal length closer. It's a similar situation to the Oppo Find X6 Pro from the parent company that owns OnePlus. But then we have something I find super interesting. We have a main camera that is a 48 megapixel f1.7 Sony Lydia T808 one by 1.43 inch sensor with 1.12 micron sized pixels binned by default to get a 12 megapixel image with 2.24 micron sized pixels. Now that Lydia is the more interesting part as it's a new branding that Sony is using for their mobile camera sensors to maybe distinguish them more from their Exmor sensor lineup that they have for both mobile and proper cameras. Long and short of it, the Lydia sensor in here is a similar technology to the Exmor T that we saw launch in the Sony Xperia 1 Mark V. Real world test that I did on that below if you want to check that out. Basically, this new sensor takes the transistor layer that would normally be paired with the photodiode, the part of the sensor that gathers light, and moves it to its own layer on the sensor. This allows the photodiode to itself be deeper, which means it can gather a claimed double the amount of light per pixel while keeping the pixel size the same, which should result in increased dynamic range of the camera. And this also means the pixel transistor can be made larger, which should reduce noise in the image as well. So, the idea is that even though it's a smaller sensor, it supposedly can keep up with the one inch type larger sensor at least according to Sony and also OnePlus. I'll let you guys be the judges though, as always, from the photos and videos in this video. Now we also have a 20 megapixel selfie camera used mainly for video calls on the inside display when unfolded, and a 32 megapixel selfie on the outside. But you should just open the phone most of the time to use the bigger sensors on the back, honestly, as mentioned. Come on. It's a foldable phone. Lastly, to just quickly address the Hasselblad branding on the camera. Hasselblad, a prominent company in the photography world for a long time now, has helped with the color tuning, we are told, but had a larger involvement in the pro mode color science. So switching to that gives you more control as you expect from pro mode on a phone, but also more Hasselblad-like colors apparently as well. As far as I can tell, it definitely at least ups the contrast for sure. Thank you.
So we're here at the cross streets of Charles and Greenwich Street on the west side of Manhattan. And there's not a ton of evidence of what I'm looking for still here, but there is one clue. In 1940, the 9th Avenue L train, as it was called, was taken down, but a trace of its existence remains. At 128 Charles Street, a tenement constructed in 1881 at the corner of Greenwich Street, a stone marker located between the third and fourth floors says Charles Street, and on the other side, Greenwich Street marking the intersection that we're at. Now, while it kind of seems unremarkable at street level today, this sign once served as a helpful guide for passengers riding the 9th Avenue L in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, indicating their location and their journey progress on the route. The Interborough Rapid Transit, or IRT 9th Avenue line, sometimes called the 9th Avenue Elevated or the 9th Avenue L, opened in July of 1868 and ran on just a single steel track and supports. It was essentially an early prototype for what a monorail is now. It ran in a loop on a single row of columns and was sometimes called the One-Legged Railroad. Now, the project was formed by Charles T. Harvey for Westside and Yonkers Patent Railway Company in April of 1866, and it was chartered with capital of $100,000 at the time to build a 25-mile elevated railroad from the southern tip of Manhattan to what is now Yonkers. The elevated railway revolutionized urban transportation at the time, offering fast travel above crowded streets that were filled with horses, carts, streetcars, and pedestrians. And this railway particularly allowed New York City to expand rapidly north during the booming years of the Industrial Revolution and mass immigration that happened after the Civil War. Okay, so here is my battery life and usage for today, for anyone who's curious about that. As always, it's a real world test day, so I use my camera way more than you ever would. Uh, but here is another day that is a much more normal day that I had for you to have something to compare it to. Now, something out of the ordinary these days, we have a charger in the box. And not just that, it's a fast 67 watt charger that can be used to get this phone from zero to 100% in about 42 minutes, which is impressive considering the 4,805 milliamp battery in here and how much slower the charging is on the Pixel Fold and the Z Fold 5. So that's nice. Now, something that everyone complains about on this phone though is the fact that the OnePlus Open doesn't have wireless charging. And frankly, it does annoy me a bit too. I personally have a ton of wireless chargers around my apartment and office, and almost no matter what phone I'm testing that week, I can easily drop it on any of the charging pads and it's good to go. It's becoming a universal convenience, and so it's a shame to just see it absent on this phone, even if, of course, it's not a big deal breaker for most people. The bigger annoyance, I think, to most reviewers at least, is OnePlus's excuse for not adding it, saying wired charging is better which sure, it's faster, but this isn't just about speed, and that it would add weight or cost or something. This is the same company that has put an IR blaster in this phone, a feature to use the phone as a universal remote, which besides causing havoc at your local bar by changing the TVs, just isn't that useful these days as everything has some form of radio frequency based controller like Bluetooth or an app, etc. these days. But that brings us to the price. The OnePlus Open is $16.99, so $100 less than the Fold 5 and the Pixel Fold. But you also get more storage as there's only one SKU, which is 512 gig model. So if you selected the 512 gig model for either of those other phones, they'd come in at about $1,920. So technically it's $220 less. But the downside is that if you don't need 512 gigs, well, too bad, because there's only one size. On top of that though, there's a $200 trade-in for any phone. Literally any phone, they said doesn't matter the condition or the model. And so that's interesting. I found an iPhone 4S on eBay for a little over $20, including shipping. So maybe you just buy that and then trade it in. Also, OnePlus says that this isn't a limited deal. It'll be going on for the life of the phone, limited to one phone per purchase, of course. But while all the companies may not have as intense of a trade-in deal as that, they all do have pretty aggressive deals right now as well. As always, I'll leave links below to the best ones that I could find. I think it's gonna be hard for OnePlus to gain a lot of traction against Samsung and Google in the foldable US market, at least. But two things. One, the truth is, that any competition in any field is always needed to kind of push that market to innovate. And two, even though Samsung basically owns all of the foldable phone market share across the world and is a much more well-known brand here in the States, as well as Google is, sometimes people just actively hate whatever is popular. Would you guys let me know what you think in the comments below? Always appreciate hearing from you guys. As always, I will leave the best price that I can find on this phone in the comments below. But it is late. I am tired. I'm going to go to bed. Good night. Plane. Plane in the West Village. Great. It's gonna land on the Hudson River. But plenty of deli sin. Dog, 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 dog. Woof, woof, woof. It's always felt a bit too squinty. Squinty. Squinty's not a word. Should be. Scooter. Scooter, scoot. Scooter's gonna scoot. There he goes. Yeah. More people, more talking, more people. Talking, 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 talking. And 283 grams of the Pixel Fold. Scooter's gonna scoot. Again. Scooter going the wrong way down a one-way street. When closed, it's 11.7 millimeters. There's a car coming. The car is wider than 11.7 millimeters, for sure. I don't even need to measure it. Oh, and a plane. Helicopter and a plane at the same time.
Great. It's 11.7 mil. Screaming baby. And helicopter. Crease is pretty well. Car. Bike. I might be losing my mind. This is what these videos are doing to me, guys. Ah. <sighs>